Hello again and welcome to Charles Kelly Money Tips. Hope you're having a great day there. Thanks for everyone who's tuning in on Facebook uh, Live and to all the groups that follow me there. Great to see you all. And thank you also to everybody that uh, uh, tunes into my podcast on iTunes and Stitcher and reads my blogs on moneytipsdaily.com. I'm also publish stuff on LinkedIn as well, by the way. Uh, to, today, I want to talk about property again. I know I, I, I talk about property a lot because a lot of our uh, listeners are property investors. You know, they're looking at property as the way to enhance their pension. Maybe they haven't got a pension. Maybe they're trying to build up something for the future, or maybe they just don't trust pensions as an industry. I used to work in the pensions and financial services industry for 25 years, and I know there's a lot of mistrust because you know big schemes like the daily mirror uh pension scheme which is supposed to be a final salary guaranteed cast iron scheme was was raided by um oh, what was that robert maxwell uh and that that was the first big scandal then the government brought in more legislation and made it difficult for company to run financial uh, for final salary pension schemes and that was kind of the end of the era of financial it was the beginning of the end anyway for for these fina, uh, final salary pension schemes run by companies. And now nearly all of the companies just run money purchase schemes. I, I've done a previous episode on that, money purchase final salary, which are not as good. And the only people are getting the guaranteed, really guaranteed pensions are civil servants, local authority workers, government workers, uh, teachers, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, police, fire brigade, MPs, of course, or why, why, why not? They, they, they know how to look after themselves. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so if, basically, if you work in the, in the government sector, the public sector, you're likely to have a, a guaranteed type of pension scheme. If you work in the private sector, you're likely to have very little in the form of pension scheme. So a lot of people invest in property. And some people invest in property to, to buy to let. Some go in for student lets. Uh, it depends on where you're living. Uh, student lets it can be quite lucrative. Uh, I know from uh, putting two kids through university that renting a property from, from a student landlord in a student city like Bristol or Leeds was very, very expensive. And the landlords you know, wanted money, a lot of money up front. They wanted you to just take uh, control of the property long before you needed it and long after you needed it. I mean, I, was, I nearly had the property virtually for a whole year and I, it was very, very expensive. Uh, so I, I know what it's like. Uh, and so I've seen it from, from that side. I don't let properties to students because I know what students can do to properties. I had friends who had student properties uh, in, in uh, up north and, and the students really made a mess of the place. And they, the place was dirty and horrible. You know, there were, you know, who knows was stay, I don't know who was staying there, but it was, it was a horrible place. Uh, so that's not an area I go into, but many landlords do specialize in student accommodation and it, it is if you do it right it's quite lucrative but you've got to know how to do it and you need to to learn how to do it however the student landlords have come under fire from the national union of students the N nus uh, for really not playing fair with students on their deposits and this has been highlighted in the bbc now as well not playing fair with the, the on their deposits and making unfair deductions and not registering the deposits with the, de the uh, tenancy deposit scheme. And the NUS have issued a, a report called Homes Fit for Study and showed that only 61% of students have their deposits returned in full and 27% of those formally challenged in the landlord deductions. And they highlight a student who, uh, a group of them were, were in, a, in a property and they were deducted not only their whole month's rent deposit, but five or six hundred pounds on top of that. And they were quoted things like that the landlord had to pull weeds out of the garden and clean the place, although they argue it was cleaner when they left it than you know when, when they occupied it. Uh, rubbish clearance, and they said there was no rubbish to clear. Anyway, they, they went through the whole process and got five hundred pounds back. So they didn't get it all back, but it's quite stressful, not only for the student, but for the landlord. So landlords... Uh, should should really be doing it professionally. They should really use in uh, uh, inventory companies or, or proper inventory at, at the start of the tenancy and at the end of the tenancy so that you don't have this argument over things. Because the students are also argued that there is wear and tear and you've got to allow a little bit for wear and tear. 
you can't uh, I, I don't think it's fair to, to say to a tenant well you've worn out the carpet you know after two years of renting a property well they can't levitate around the property can they you know they've got to use the carpet and the floor and uh, some things will wear out but clearly if they've damaged things if they've been uh, reckless and damaged things then you've probably you, you've then got a right to charge for things if they've made a complete mess of the place but there's got to be a bit of give and take and I think the the uh, inventory can help that uh, so you have a professional inventory at the start it can run to like several pages 20 30 40 pages where they go through everything and check everything and then that inventory is covered on the way out so that that could help to avoid all of these arguments and and I think the landlord if they if they give a property in a, in a good state, a nice property that's clean and tidy and uh, decorated and smells good and all that sort of thing, then they can do, do an inventory and expect to get that property back in the same state. I think people look after places and respect places that are clean and, and tidy and to start with. And I've seen some horrible properties that landlords uh, offer. And I, I just don't know, I don't understand why a landlord would uh, not want a property to be nice, not want to maintain a property. I mean, one of the things this, this landlord he deducted for was painting over mould. Well, hang on, why is there mould in the property in the first place? He's charged them for painting over mould. And you don't paint over mould anyway. You get rid of the mould first and then you paint, paint it. So the judge, whoever's judging this, should have decided there and then that the property was probably not in a good state. And the, and the, the students claimed that they had told the landlord about this mould uh, you know, for ages and, and nothing had happened. So I, I think the landlord's got some responsibility uh, and, and, and so so is the tenants, obviously, because invariably, uh, you know, tenants do get away with murder. Uh, the, the authorities tend to, to side with the tenancies more often than not, I find. Uh, but, you know, tenancies can walk away and not pay their rent for a couple of months and walk away. And it's very hard to chase them for money. It's very hard to get money back off them, even if you've got deposits. So just, just be careful. Um, I've, I've got a few tips, I think, for landlords. I mean, first of all, use an inventory company. Secondly, be aware that the Tenants Fees Act came into force, I think, in June of this year. So, so do look at that. Uh, secondly, deposits must be registered with the government-backed tenancy deposit scheme. Uh, the NUS has... has has cited that some landlords are not using this scheme and th this can be difficult you should be using this scheme uh, if you go for possession and you haven't used this scheme the judges can take a very dim view they can fine the landlords they can refuse uh, possession and, and all sorts of things so you, you've got to use this scheme uh, that that's been the law for a long time now so so it's, you, you can't just put the, the deposit in your pocket and then student letting, I, I, as I said, can be lucrative, but it is a specialist area and you should learn how to do it properly and professionally. And if you don't know how to do it, take some courses. I'll, I'll be talking about courses in a minute, but take some courses to learn how to do it pro properly and professionally. And, you know, it's obviously specialised in certain areas and some areas have what's called Article 4 restrictions on converting properties into uh, houses in multiple occupations, which are generally used for student accommodation uh, so you've got to be careful of that like if you buy a big house and say well, I'll convert this because it's near a university and I'll convert it into you know six seven rooms and let it to students and make a lot of money you might find that <clears throat> that local authority will have an article what's called an article 4 restriction which means you cannot uh, convert that into a, a, a HMO you can't get a license for it and then you'll, you'll be stuck with it and you know normally you can find these things out from your local council but I think most student areas will have this restriction because of, you know, they don't want to see the whole town turned into a, a student uh, HMO area. So they, they have to put these restrictions on. So just be careful of that. Sometimes whole cities can have these. I think Nottingham is an area that is difficult to get. I mean, you can buy an existing HMO, but you can't get one for uh, a new HMO. Not, uh, Nottingham, Hatfield's got, got them. Uh, areas around Uxbridge and that sort of thing. There's lots of them. So just be careful of that. And and then remember that corporate landlords are out for your lunch. They're, they're trying to get the best students. They're trying to get the best students with the most money. The, the foreign students may be coming over from China who've got unlimited money. And, the, and they're looking at these sort of things and they're rubbing their hands together because if the private landlords are letting the side down, it, it, it plays more into the hands of these corporate landlords who are 
who were building properties. And I did a report on this last week. Some of them were built shiny new properties, not even finished them by the time the students moved in. But generally, they're, once they get their act together, they will be taking the best students and putting them into nice, shiny new buildings with you know, uh, all the facilities and common areas and nice, nice places to live. They'll be charging more and making more money on it, but it's taken away from the private landlords. So just watch out for that. And yesterday, I, I also asked the question, are HMOs dying out because of these corporate landlords having co-living spaces that are taking the best and, and the young professional students? They charge a lot more. You know, a typical room in, in a HMO could be 500, 600 pounds, but in these co-living spaces, they could be a thousand, twelve hundred, or thirteen hundred pounds. So just watch out for that. And the other thing I said, I said earlier that a lot, a lot of investors are looking at property as a way to retire. I mean, I would ask you the question: Can you afford to retire? Will you be able to afford to retire? And what is your your plan? What what's your strategy? Uh, and and millions of people, I would say, eighty percent of the population, four out of five people, are not going to be able to afford to retire comfortably and live comfortably and this is in the UK and America and they'll be the ones who will not be able to stop working or they might end up pushing 50 trolleys around a supermarket car park and I don't know how they do that but they do it and they have to do it and they're out there in the cold uh, pushing trolleys around or doing jobs they don't want to do because they can't afford to retire. So what is your plan? What, what's your, your strategy? Now I think property is a very good strategy for retirement but you've got to know how to do it properly. And in case you're worried about how to buy property when you haven't got money for deposits, you might say, well, I can't buy a property. I haven't got any savings. And I think the average amount of savings in the country is around 5,000 pounds. So most people on average haven't got money to buy property. But there is a way you can buy property using creative finance and creative finance strategies to buy property with no money down or none of your own money down. In some cases, no money at all down. And you can use these tools to build a massive property portfolio. And I've seen it happen. I, I know people are doing it. I know young people who are out there. Um, some of them have not even, you know, they've only been in this country for a few years and hardly got their feet under the table. And they're out there using these strategies to build income, first of all, and then build property portfolios, uh, uh, which can, you know, over a five year period could run into millions. And I, I've, I know people have done this and gone from broke and in massively in debt to become a millionaire within multimillionaire within f five years. But even if you don't want to be a multimillionaire super landlord, you can use these strategies to build up enough income to replace your job within a year uh, using these no money down strategies. So before you buy any property, before you rush out and buy a property, especially a student property or you know, whether it's your first property or you're an experienced lender, before you do anything else, take time to learn proven no money down strategies because eventually you will run out of deposits if you've got a deposit at all. If you just go and buy one property with your deposit, then that, that's gone, isn't it? Your deposit's gone and it, would, it could take you a long time to build up uh, another deposit. So use the no money down strategies as well as, you know, using your own money if you have the money. Obviously, it's nice to have the money. But you can learn this from expert multimillionaires on a free uh, taster course on a free discovery day a no money down discovery day uh, which will be coming up soon in your area so let me know if you're interested in that and just email me charles at charleskelly.net or on my uh, uh, messenger uh, or facebook messenger just just drop me a line on there and I'll, I'll put you in touch with the company running the courses i don't run them myself i i, I leave those to the experts who, who, who specialise in these areas, but there's lots of different strategies you can use to build up a, a sizable portfolio or just replace your income so that you can quit the rat race within a year. That's, that's a, a worthy goal and it wouldn't take that long if you follow those instructions and follow those things and take action. It's no good sitting there saying, well, that would be nice to do if you don't take the action. Nothing moves without action. Nothing moves at all unless you start getting up off the chair Get, you know, switching off the TV for a while and taking some action or spending a day on, on a free discovery day or a free taster course to, to learn and, and mingle with people and network with like-minded people who are, who are what I would say getting there. They're, they're moving forward. They're getting there. They're not sitting down saying there's no opportunity. What about Brexit? What about the trade war? What about this? What about that? You know, they're just getting on with it. You know, 
you've got to be like that. You've got to take action and get on with it. So if you're interested, let me know. And it's charles at charleskelly.net is my email. But my you, you can obviously contact me through my Facebook Messenger, Facebook page. I have a Money Tips daily community and a Money Tips daily page on, on Facebook as well, Money Tips. So get in touch. And um, I, th I think that's all for now. Have a great evening. This is Charles Kelly bringing you Money Tips to help you save, earn, invest, accumulate and enjoy more money.